Hello, my name is Hesham. I work as a data scientist at Samsung Research in the UK. And in this talk, I'll be sharing one of the ways in which we've been using causal modeling to help address the problems we face when it comes to optimizing performance in mobile games. To give a bit of an overview of this talk, I'll be covering these three main areas. First, some background about mobile game performance, where I'll give you a rough idea of what we mean by it contrasting it with PC and console gaming, and talk about some of the ways in which Samsung, as a device manufacturer, actively works to improve performance. Then I'll highlight a problem which will lead to the next section on causal modeling. Just as a preface, this is quite an open-ended area. I won't go into too much detail on the math or the logic involved in causal reasoning, but I'll give a few examples to illustrate some of the concepts and hopefully cover most of the key areas. And finally, I'll give a sort of toy application of how we've applied causal modeling and inference to help answer some of the questions we have when it comes to game performance optimization. So hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll have a decent idea about how we like to tackle these problems and perhaps be inspired to use similar approaches when dealing with your own problems. So to kick things off, let's think about what's involved in gaming at a high level. We have a gamer and a game. Now, unfortunately, our gamer can't experience the game directly. Instead, they have to interact with the game by means of a device, and in this case, it's a phone. Now, the game designers first and foremost care about delivering a particular experience for the gamer. It could be an engaging story, creative game mechanics, or even just something to pass the time. This all forms part of the game experience. Game performance, on the other hand, mostly serves to put limits on that vision. Uh, for example, both the developer and gamer may just want a smooth game that looks great. But in reality, this translates to things like a frame rate, which may come at the cost of resolution that the game is rendered at. And a lot of work and compromise is needed to ensure that neither one of those suffers too much. So in some manner, the purpose of the device is to facilitate the game experience and try and pose as little friction as possible possible uh, while doing so. If we compare this to more traditional gaming devices like consoles and PCs, where the performance trade-off is usually just between the graphical quality and the frame rate, on mobile devices there are other important factors which can't be ignored. The big ones being temperature and power. Mobile phones tend not to have active cooling, so are more susceptible to heat, and adding to that they tend to be handled directly. So if it does get hot, the person holding the phone would definitely be able to feel it. And in terms of power, unless you play games with your phone plugged in, they have a limited battery life. And so even if the game you're playing offers a great experience, it won't be as good if you have to stop because your phone is running low on power. Here's a simple sketch illustrating a possible trade-off between FPS, which is pretty close to what we want to measure in terms of the game experience, and temperature. So as we start the game session off, the FPS is high and stable. Maybe it's a 60 FPS game, but you can see that the temperature is rising during this. You may hit a point where the temperature is getting too high. And in most systems, when this happens, we can get a degree of throttling where the CPU or GPU clock speeds are lowered to help push down the temperature. Now this can come at the, the cost of the previously high and smooth frame rates and so they drop by some amount. Then when we reach some level of equilibrium, the frame rate and the temperature are both sort of stable. Now for some games, the behavior shown here would be perfectly fine, uh, but for others, it would be noticeable by the player and give a subpar game experience. We've done a fair bit of work in the past, breaking down the factors that go into a good gaming experience. We're looking at approaches on how they can be quantified in a way that resonates with gamers who themselves may have different expectations depending on the types of games they play, uh, when and how they play their games. Just to help illustrate this idea a little more, if we look at the two games here, for example, uh, we have League of Legends uh, on mobile and Hearthstone. And we think to ourselves, if we had a similar drop in FPS in both games, which would be more impactful to the game experience? 
If you're familiar with them, I'm sure the answer will be obvious, but for those who aren't, I'll say that League of Legends is a faster paced real time game where a drop in performance can make quite a big difference uh, and can actually be the deciding factor between winning and losing a game. Hearthstone, on the other hand, is a turn based game and a drop in FPS may make some of the animations a little jarring, but for the most part, it won't affect your enjoyment by a massive amount uh, and definitely won't affect your actual performance in the game itself. So we've talked about some of the components that are important when it comes to game performance and alluded to the fact that they should map onto parts of the game experience, which is the thing we actually care about. Uh, so how do we at Samsung help deliver on this? And by that, I mean trying to improve game performance as much as possible, such that the game experience uh, isn't impaired in any way. Besides the actual hardware of the, the phones, we built intelligent systems which run on the devices, um, such as Game Booster. And in this case, it monitors and dynamically adjusts device side settings to optimize performance when gaming. All of this is with the aim to provide high and stable frame rates while controlling temperatures and power usage. Alongside the real-time optimization that we have running on devices, we also take a more global view of performance. Across our full range of devices, we analyze game performance from billions of real game sessions to make sure that they're performing as expected and help us react faster when issues crop up. One of the ways we do this is through global optimization of device side settings through this analysis. Uh, when a user plays a game on their phone, given the appropriate agreement, we produce representative measures through aggregation and based on transformations that highlight the particular aspects of performance that we care about, we monitor um, performance over time. You can see here that we have a few plots showing distributions of different measures of FPS and temperature for particular games. And we have systems in place such that if things drastically change for some reason, we can react appropriately. Uh, one of the ways being this global optimization. The way this global optimization typically works is that users play games on their phones and during their game session, measures like FPS and temperature are monitored and stored locally. We do some lightweight processing on the phone to capture the measures we think are important for understanding the general performance. These could be things like average FPS, the battery level, or the change in temperatures during the session, but also various states that we think are important, like whether the phone is charging at the time. These representative measures are then sent to a server where we aggregate and analyze the general trends across all users there we can compare performance from different perspectives, like comparing the same game across multiple types of phones. You can imagine from this, we could get a sense if, for example, a particular model is running into a certain type of issue, or even an issue that only occurs under very specific circumstances. Uh, this information is useful in general and helps our engineers focus on investigating key issues with a lot more context than if they were just operating on, say, general user feedback. But for the purpose of device setting optimization, there are instances where we can automatically tune these settings based on our analysis and send those settings back to user devices. The actual optimization takes a very conservative approach, making only minor alterations at a time so that we don't inadvertently overshoot performance targets. So as you can see, this sets us up with a nice general iterative process where our users gradually get a better experience over time. Here's an example showing the aggregated performance of a game running on a particular device model over the course of about two months. The performance measure is actually an indication of the prevalence of a particular type of FPS issue. So in this case, the lower the number is, the better the performance. Looking at how it changes over time allows us to see how stable things are or whether certain issues are getting worse and may need addressing. So if we look at the, this plot, we can make a few observations. From the start, we see the performance fluctuating slightly, but over time showing a general increase. 
As these are point measures from a distribution of session measures, the fluctuations could be down to things like fewer players playing on a given day, which could give us a higher variance. Or even it could just be general changes in player behavior. The trend showing a slight increase over time, which as a reminder is worsening performance, may also come down to player behavior, but Often we found that these longer term changes correspond to things like a game update being uh, pushed out. You can imagine a game that has new content may perform slightly differently from older content. And while many developers do test their games thoroughly in-house, it's difficult to do so of every possible device out there. If we look further along, we then see as we transition from the green part of the plot to the white part, which is not a coincidence, uh, that the performance suddenly improves. And this just so happens to coincide with an optimization trigger. So at this particular point in time, our system has, based on this measure as well as others, opted to tune the device settings with an aim to improve performance. Great, it appears to be working as intended. It might make some of you think though, can we really be sure that it was the parameter update which led to an improvement or could it have been due to something else? Now, in this particular case, I would say perhaps you're being a little bit cynical, uh, but the point in general does stand. And in many cases, it's far less clear what actually led to the, a change in performance, both because we're dealing with a complex and dynamic system, uh, but also because the change is often far more subtle than what's shown here. This leads us to the main problem we're focusing on in this talk, which is essentially a question of attribution, answering the question, what led to this change in performance? Though for our particular problem case, we're actually dealing with a slight variation on this, which is a problem of intervention. Stated as a question, this would be, when we purposely change this particular device setting, did it lead to a change in the performance? The reason why this is difficult is, as I mentioned earlier, because we're dealing with a system that's very complex. It has a lot of working parts that interact with uh, one another at different timescales. Also, when we think about these working parts uh, involved in the interactions, we're not necessarily able to control many of them. If you think back to the parties involved in gaming, uh, we had the player, the game, and the device. We only really deal with one part of that formula. And so it's not necessarily as straightforward as just looking at when the intervention was carried out and just saying that the change in performance was due to that intervention. So what's the solution then? Well, we could leverage the data we have and do an in-depth statistical analysis looking at associations between the variables that we can measure, but often this can result in unintuitive or potentially misleading results. As the saying goes, a correlation does not necessarily imply causation. Instead, what we did with this work was opted to use a process of causal inference to, as shown from the Wikipedia definition here, determine the actual effect of a particular phenomenon. There are a few different approaches you can take when looking at causality. One of the most popular and often proclaimed as the gold standard of causal inference is the RCT, or Randomized Controlled Trial. I'm sure many of you already know what a randomized controlled trial is, but for those who don't, or perhaps need a reminder, I'll give a quick explanation here. Bear in mind this is pretty simplified, but on the plus side, it all fits nicely into one slide. Now remember, we're looking to see if an intervention has a real causal effect on some particular outcome, whether it be the efficacy of a drug on a particular disease, or more seriously, the effect of a parameter change on game performance. So we start off with a population of individuals. Now these could be people or specific devices, uh, but essentially they're just the unit that you could potentially apply a treatment to. We then sample from this population at random to form two groups, one being a group that you applied the treatment to and the other acting as a control group that doesn't receive the treatment. The critical point with this is because we randomly sampled, which is not necess necessarily a trivial thing to do, we can then say we're justified in assuming that besides application of the treatment, 
every other possible factor that could affect the outcome has essentially been averaged out. We then wait a period of time, which depending on the particular problem, could be anywhere from near instant to several days, weeks, months, or even more. Um, finally, we're in a position at the end where we can measure the change in the outcome for both of the groups. Again, this could be how performance of our phone running a game changes or whether a disease has been cured or improved in some way. And from this, we can calculate expectations of this change using our samples and then measure the difference between our groups, which gives us an average treatment effect. Uh, in this little cartoon example here, we can see it's 43%. So that would be a 43% increase in the probability of having an improved outcome uh, when receiving a treatment compared to when you don't receive the treatment. Uh, I've clearly admitted some important parts here. One of the more notable being uh, an assessment on whether the results are actually significant or not. Uh, but hopefully you can appreciate the main points here. Now, despite the title of gold standard that RCTs have, they aren't completely devoid of issues, some of them relating to the assumptions in the method and some relating to more practical matters. First and foremost, running an actual trial may not necessarily be feasible. In a lot of cases, certain infrastructure needs to be put in place to make it actually possible to run. You have to be able to reliably do things like select from a population, uh, treat and track individuals uh, and then be able to assess them at the end. They can take time to run, as mentioned, uh, depending on the effect you're trying to measure and the particular nature of the problem, you might get immediate feedback or it could take a very long time. RCTs also work on the principle of good randomization. This means that in sampling from the original population, we assume that all the other factors besides the treatment are averaged out, as I mentioned before. Uh, in practice, this can actually be quite difficult, particularly when you can only sample a small part of the population. In many cases, one of the incentives is to sample as few participants as possible. The reason being, if there are any potential negative outcomes from applying a treatment, you want to minimize that, that potential harm. Uh, and tying the two previous points together, it could be that the longer you run experiments for, the higher the chance that this uh, principle of randomization, good randomization, actually fails. So what could we do as an alternative? Well, one way in which we can still try and tackle this problem is by using causal modeling, where there are many different approaches but essentially we set up a model that captures these causal dependencies that we know of uh, based on an understanding of the particular domain or particular problem we're working on, and then use that model in a particular way to measure the causal effect that we otherwise directly measured using the randomized control trial. So what is causal modeling? Well, causal modeling is an approach whereby we create a mathematical model of a system that explicitly captures causal connections between variables. You can see here we have a simple graph that is comprised of several nodes, which represent variables in the system we're modeling, and edges, which represent the causal connections between pairs of those variables. You can see here that there are possibilities for both many-to-one connections, as well as one-to-many. Uh, for example, both C and A are direct causal variables with respect to B uh, and indirectly causal of D and E. I'll focus on a particular flavor of model that is often used for causal modeling, that being a Bayesian network, which is a type of probabilistic graphical model. What this means is that the graph as a whole represents a joint probability distribution, but in a factorized form as a collection of conditional probability distributions. Uh, don't worry if you're not too familiar with the terms, 
I'll be showing a simple example next to illustrate what I mean by this. Uh, and Bayesian networks in particular have a certain constraint which defines them in that they are required to be a DAG or directed acyclic graph. What this means is that all the edges must be directed. They can't work in both ways. And also that the graph can't contain cycles uh, where a variable indirectly uh, connects back to itself by following a subset of the edges. So to give a very simple example of what the graph might be representing, let's think about rain. Using your understanding of the world, how it works, if we wanted to have a model which captured the mechanics of rain, what could we do? Uh, avoiding the massive complexity that actually goes into modeling the weather, we can ignore all the physics and just consider two variables, one that captures the level of cloudiness and another that captures whether it's actually raining or not. We then use our understanding of the domain to say that clouds cause rain. There's probably some particular mechanism in which rain can cause clouds to form. Uh, in fact, if you remember back to your primary school lessons on evaporation and precipitation, you can imagine that the true causal model will probably be some cyclical process, but we could ignore that for now. Um, next, we want to represent the model as a probability distribution. For the cloudy variable, we simply have a distribution over the possible states. So we have none, some, and uh, lots. Uh, it's, prob it's a probability distribution, so it all sums to one. For the rain, instead of representing it as just a marginal probability distribution, we have a conditional probability distribution, which imparts the fact that the rain state is dependent on the cloudy state. We can look at the probability values, and uh, from that we see that for each cloudy state, the rain distribution sums up to one. In terms of where we actually get these probabilities from, uh, part of the appeal of this type of modeling is that they can both be learned directly from any data you might have available, uh, but also defined based on experience, uh, much like I've made up these values here. This is a very basic model, but you can imagine that as you include more variables and connections between them, it can be used to represent systems that are quite complex. Let's take a toy example to really illustrate the benefits of explicit causal modeling. If we look at the simple scatter plot of X and Y values here, we can see that there's a pretty clear positive correlation between the two variables. Great, we can fit a simple linear model to it and call it a day. But let's pause for a second. Perhaps inadvertently, we've made an implicit assumption here that X caused Y in some way. Uh, but are we sure that's actually the case? Now, depending on the purpose of the model, this might not actually matter. It could be that you just want to predict y from x. As long as there's no cheating happening, it doesn't necessarily matter if x caused y or y caused x. But when we are asking questions about attribution and intervention, we do care. So how can we be sure it shouldn't have been modeled the other way around? Like with the rain example, once we're given a little more context to what the variables actually are, things are a lot more obvious. Just to draw it back into the topic at hand, we see that the X variable is representing the screen size of a phone and Y represents the drainage rate of the battery. So with a little understanding of the domain, we can make the well-reasoned assertion that the size of the screen will impact the rate that the battery drains and not the other way around. So fairly straightforward. Let's look at another case. Again, we have an unknown x and y and a clear association between the two. So what causes what? This time we see that we have battery size and FPS or the frame rate for the two variables. These two concepts don't really seem like they'd relate to one another, at least directly. Maybe there's some strange connection between the amount of power available and the FPS. Um, I'm not so sure what's really going on here. In this instance, we actually have a case of a spurious correlation caused by a confounder. If we consider the confounder, which in this case we add as a variable representing the particular model of the device, we can then update our model to show a more sensible set of connections. 
The device model, you can think of things like a high-end, mid-end, or low-end device, may all have different sizes of batteries, and so there's a causal association between them. And in a similar way, the capability of those different tier devices may result in different FPS performance. Once we account for this by explicitly modeling it, while there's still a statistical correlation between the battery size and FPS, we're in a better position to properly measure the causal relationship between the two. So now that we've included the compounder, can we use it to look at how battery size relates to FPS? One thing we can do is condition on variables prior to looking at the associations. This is useful as it's one way in which we can remove the confounding effect. Here we can see that we've set the device to model A. If we look at the scatterplot now, we're effectively left with a straight line of points where there's no correlation, or in fact, it's not even defined. Because for this model, we only actually have one battery size. You might have heard of this being termed as controlling for a variable. So now we have a tool to use for our original problem of game performance optimization. It seems to have some nice properties and that we can explicitly state what we know about a system, encoding that knowledge as nodes and edges of the graph. We can use data we have available to define the conditional probability distributions. And we have a mechanism to remove the effect of some variables, allowing us to examine some relationships um, and not others focusing on just the ones we care about. So let's first take a step back and clearly state what we want to know by posing a question. In this case, if I increase my parameter value, will performance increase? Already with this, we can set up a very simple graph with, with one edge. Uh, but let's think about how we can build a more expressive causal model. When building a model of a complex system, one reasonable approach is to start with the conceptual model and then use it to develop the statistical model. With this, we're working purely with components of the system that we think are important. For example, we may want to capture the concept of a smooth frame rate and represent it with a quantitative measure, such as the median FPS value. Uh, for the activity of the CPU, which we may think influences the frame rate, we can represent it as a load value and a frequency value. We can then reason about how these conceptual components relate to one another as pairs of causal connections, which when combined builds the skeleton of our eventual model. This is one part where you can leverage expertise from the domain and democratize your design process. Here's an example of where we have started with some conceptual nodes of parts of the system we think are important. We then assert which directed connections would be causal, as well as how we would want to quantify each of the nodes. We have a node for charging, battery, and display brightness, and we convert them to a flag for charging and average values for both the battery drainage and display brightness. Keep in mind that they represent distributions. So for example, in the case of the charging flag, we would have a simple binary state and so represent it with a Bernoulli distribution. For the average values, you can model them with different types of distributions, such as Gaussian. Though I'll say for many of the available Bayesian network packages, uh, typically they involve converting all continuous measures into discrete values. And so you would use something like a discrete multinomial distribution to represent them. Taking the approach I've outlined, we can start by collecting together the components we believe to be important in modeling the system which in this case includes the measures I've sort of mentioned before, like FPS, CPU, and GPU information, as well as the optimization parameter that we're interested in uh, measuring the effect of. You can see from the table we have here uh, that we have quantitative representations for each of them, uh, and where each row represents data from an individual gaming session. This will provide the basis for actually fitting the probability distributions in the eventual model. Along with defining the nodes, we also leverage our understanding of the domain and expert advice to design the structure of the full graphical model. Uh, on the left-hand side here, you can see how the edges are defined in code as simple pairs of parent and child nodes. The node names then correspond to the fields that we saw in the previous table. 
even though the connections were defined on a pairwise basis, which makes it easy to actually reason about, you can see that once everything is combined into a single graph, it reveals interesting chains of causal connections that may not have been too obvious before. Just to highlight a few uh, of the parts, uh, we can see that we have some nodes that have no parents, others that have no children, and some that have both. If we look at the nodes with no parents, like the brightness and charging nodes, it seems reasonable given that an individual user may decide to pick any brightness level or charge their phone completely independent uh, to anything that's happening within the game. On the other hand, you can argue that a variable like duration may depend on the date to some degree, given that people play more or less depending on the day of the week. Uh, one point I'd like to highlight is that you might actually disagree with uh, that reasoning and in general, um, sort of the justification for some of the connections. So you might not ever fully be satisfied with the model structure. After all, you're not going to actually be able to model the true data generating process. But as long as you prioritize the mechanisms you think are most important to the problem you're trying to tackle, the rest of the model doesn't have to be perfect. One thing I should say is that for this example, I've used a very user-friendly Python library for building Bayesian networks uh, called CausalNex, uh, which has been developed by Quantum Black. As I mentioned before, where data is available, which is by design in this case, we can fit the model parameters, that is the probability distributions based on real data. For this example, I have discretized all values into fairly coarse uh, bins. You'll find usually there's some sort of trade-off being made in the discretization process, typically between how expressive the model is uh, versus how understandable it is. Just as an example, we can see the conditional probability table produced for the duration node. Uh, if you recall, it only had one parent node, that being the date. Uh, and we can see that for a range of date values, we have distributions that slightly vary from one another. The duration variable has been converted into a three state distribution, zero, one, or two, based on quantiles of the original data. Uh, and it basically represents short, medium, and long sessions. Once we have our full model, both the structure and fitted probability distributions, we can now think about how we go about using that model to answer our original question of how the optimization parameter affects the performance measure. There are a lot of details I'll be omitting at this stage, uh, but to briefly summarize what happens here, we first determine all the possible paths between the node we're intervening on, so that's our optimization parameter, and the target node, in which case we're looking at the median FPS node. We then carry out some operations to effectively block the paths that we're not interested in measuring. If you think back to the confounder example before, in effect, we're carrying out similar operations that stop the flow through one path and uh, leave only the paths of interest. And finally, we compute the posterior probability using this adjusted graph. I should say that many packages that are available automate a lot of this process for you so that you only need to provide the abstract information about what you want to measure uh, and it will handle the details for you. To make the idea a little clearer, we can look at how that would appear in our model. Let's start by first looking at the paths from our optimization parameter to our performance measure, in this case, the median FPS. We can see that we have one direct connection between the two, which is based on the idea that we believe it has some sort of effect on FPS. We can't necessarily define all the detail of that mechanism, but we can provide this direction to it. Uh, however, we've added a bit more detail in that we understand part of the way that the mechanism works is through manipulation of the CPU and GPU with an aim to provide high and smooth FPS throughout a gaming session. So with these, we have both indirect causal connections as well as the direct causal connection. Both of them are of legitimate interest when trying to answer our question. So we want to include all of these paths in our analysis. That's not quite the full story though, as we have a parent for our parameter uh, that we're intervening on. Much in the same way that the duration variable could be affected by the date, 
we can definitely say that the optimization parameter setting is. As in its normal operation, it will be changing throughout time. You might think that doesn't necessarily matter, but if you follow through with the new possible paths, we can see that there are alternatives uh, that lead to median FPS, uh, one through the duration variable and the other through the game version. And arguably both of these are at least partly determined by the date and have the potential to affect performance. Uh, these are termed uh, backdoor paths. And as I mentioned before, uh, they're the ones that we want to close off in our analysis. If we just conditioned on the optimization parameter, information would still be able to flow through these paths and give us an incorrect assessment of the causal effect. Again, I won't cover the detail on exactly how it's carried out, but in effect, we block this backwards path so that we're left with what's termed the interventional graph, where the optimization parameter has no parent node now. That connection has been severed. Um, now we're in the position where we can change its state independent of anything that's that was upstream of it. Uh, so in principle, it's now similar to what we had in the randomized control trial, where every other factor is considered to be averaged out, uh, or in this case, controlled for, except for the thing we are concerned with, which is the treatment or uh, intervention on the optimization parameter. So what do we see if we now condition on the interventional graph? Uh, with a focus on median FPS, which in this instance has been transformed into two bins, uh, zero and one, you can treat them roughly as being low and high FPS, uh, though they've been split based on the original distribution. So in reality, the low values aren't necessarily low. They're just in the lower half of the distribution. Uh, at the top, you can see that we've set the optimization parameter to setting A, uh, and we have a change in the distribution of our other nodes when we do this. So looking at the median FPS specifically, you can see that the proportion has shifted slightly towards the, the poorer class, the zero class, um, compared to when it's not conditioned on anything. Uh, when we instead set the optimization parameter to B, we can see that the distribution shifts towards class one, which is comparatively better FPS. So now in much the same way that we calculated the average treatment effect for the randomized control trial example, we can do the same thing here to estimate the improvement that would occur due to our intervention of moving from setting A to setting B. I'd just like to close things on a few further remarks of this approach. Um, domain knowledge may exist between multiple groups. So having more people involved in the design process of the graph can be beneficial. Additionally, when there's a lack of data, as is common in many real world problems, an expert still may be able to use their intuition about uh, the mechanisms of the process to give some sort of uh, conditional probabilities between factors in the graph. They can be embedded directly as prior information as well as being refined with real data when that becomes available. For very complex systems, there are also a number of approaches which uh, actually aim to learn the structure of the graph directly from the data, and this is called structural learning. Uh, but even in those cases, the standard adv advice is to always uh, manually tune the graph afterwards using domain knowledge where possible. Um, and there are a few uh, methods for inference. Uh, some are exact and others are approximate. Uh, one thing to note is that as the complexity of the graph grows in size, and by size I mean the number of connections and states, and it will be dependent on the particular query you're running, uh, it may be that you have to strike a balance between how detailed or precise the model is and the time it actually takes to run the model. So that could be reduced in the number of connections or the number of states uh, that your nodes can take. Uh, 
That brings us to the end of this talk. So I'd like to thank those who are listening in, and I hope we're able to inspire some of you to consider applying causal inference to the problems you're working on. I would say particularly people who typically use A-B testing for things like game design or marketing may see some value in applying methods like this to historical data. And also anywhere that you generally feel that there's a disconnect between data analysis that you're carrying out and the general domain knowledge that may be spread throughout different teams in your company. This seems like a nice way of combining it all together. So thanks again, and I hope you'll enjoy the rest of the conference.